Welcome to the Wealthy Warlock channel again, and uh, I'm here for another wacky time. Um, this is part two of business trusts as substitutes for business corporations, which is a paper being read before the Kansas City Bar Association, April 10th, 1920, by Guy A. Thompson, uh, Esquire of the St. Louis Bar. This was a book contained at Stanford Library and has been released to the general population on compliments of Google and its service that it does in some directions for humanity. Um, one of them, in, which is to catalog and digitize all um, books that enter into the public domain after a hundred years of copyright uh, to then re-enter into service for humanity as opposed to service for the individual who is now likely passed on after a hundred years since publication. So that's where and how we've come to this book, which was just obtained through Open Library. I'll share a link for it in the comments here, as well as a link to part one, of course, um, which also has the links that I'm mentioning as well. Moving on, we've already started and gone through up until, I think it was about page 18 in the book, which is about page 24 in the document-ish. Section 11, we're looking for bingo. Section 11. Now, in the previous recording, it was cut short from my exit, as well as uh, half of the word incorporation. So part one ends literally of an incorp. And that's it. So incorporation was to finish off that previous video and was just to say that I've run out of time and we'll be continuing with part two at a later date. Welcome back for part two. Uh, section 11, may the state forbid it. The question is not whether the state may constitutionally abolish the express trust in the interest of the public welfare, but whether it may prevent such use of the trust as we are considering. The constitutionality of such preventative legislation is a question. The adequate consideration of which this occasion does not permit. Suffice it to observe that such legislation could find warrant only in the police power, that there is a limit beyond which that power may not be exercised that if a business or the manner in which a business is conducted is injurious to the community, it may not shield itself behind the constitutional guarantee of life or contract, that if a business or the manner in which it is conducted is not injurious to the community, these constitutional bulwarks render it impervious to legislative attack, and that whether considerations of the public advantage require the suppression of a trade, advocation, or business, or the means by which or the manner in which it is conducted, cannot be decided by mere legislative fiat. Now, but that remains for the final determination by the court under the facts as they actually exist in the light of recognized legal principles and constitutional rights. Now, I was under the assumption that uh, fiat meant fake or false. So the etymology for fiat actually kind of gets into um, let it be done authoritative sanction by a decree, command, or order, um, which is really interesting. Uh, I, yeah, like I said, I was under the assumption in general English it just meant fake or you know, false. Um, so... or the manner in which it can be done cannot be decided by mere legislative order is what that point there is saying and emphasis on that because that's very important. Section 12, will quo warrant or lie? Uh, concerning the second inquiry suggested, namely whether in the absence of statute quo warrant or would lie for assuming or usurping the privileges of a franchise of a corporation, but is sorry, it is submitted that it should not. For us being the privileges of a corporation, the privileges exercised by a business trust are those which are merely accessory as distinguished from essential attributes or privileges of a corporation. It was formerly thought that the privilege of having transferable shares could be had only by charter from the Crown or by act of Parliament 
and that pretending to be possessed of this privilege was pretending to act as a corporation and that therefore it was illegal at common law to attempt to create a body not having the protection of the king's charter, the shares of which might be assigned without any control or restriction whatsoever. This view has long since been, uh, uh, has long since exploded and would now would be now dismissed with that statement except for its historic interest in relation to the subject under discussion and that even to this day it is an impression widely prevailing among the laity. The joint stock company that is unincorporated company with numerous members or partners holding transferable shares was recognized as a valuable instrument of commerce as early as the last decade of the 17th century. While such company was a partnership in that unlimited liability for its obligations rested upon its members or shareholders, still it differed from the ordinary partnership in the multiplicity of the members or partners. The absence of the principal delectus personae in consequence of the transferability of shares or interests and in the fact that it was not dissolved by the death of a member. While it was useful for the mobilization of credit, its very existence encouraged wild speculation and became the means of perpetrating gross frauds. Many of these companies also assumed to operate under abandoned corporate charters whose powers were utterly foreign to the purpose of the new organization. England's tremendously expanding commerce following the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 found these joint stock companies rapidly increasing, and with their increase, the public was seized with a mania for stock gambling and speculation. They were organized for the promotion of the most chimerical and whimsical schemes. For example, one company was formed for the breeding of silkworms in Chelsea Park, another for importing a large jackass or large jackasses from Spain in order to propagate a larger kind of mule in England, another for making salt water fresh, while project, while another project was thus advertised in the newspapers for subscribing two million to a certain promising or profitable design, which will hereafter be promulgated. That's, that's funny that has, um, I've seen that being perpetrated today in many different forms, um, most notably in the coaching industry. An authoritative historian refers to the year 1720 as a year remarkable beyond any which any other which can be pitched upon by historians for extraordinary and romantic projects, proposals, and undertakings, both national and private. We're pushing that nowadays, aren't we? <laughs> he further records, any impudent imposter with the delirium was at its greatest height. While the delirium was at its greatest height, need only to hire a room at some coffee house or another or some other house near that alley for a few hours to open a subscription book for somewhat relative commerce, manufacture, plantations, or of some supposed invention, either newly hatched out of his own brain or else stolen from any of the abortive projects of which we have given an account in former reigns, having first adver advertised it in the newspapers the preceding day, and he might in a few hours find subscriptions for one to two millions, in some cases, more of imaginary stock. <laughs> Among these many bubbles, there were some so bare face and palpably gross as to not have so much as a shadow of anything like feasibility. Accordingly, that same year, 1720, in order to put an end to such companies and the feverish speculation that was proving so harmful to the nation, Parliament passed that famous act known as the Bubble Act. The law against bubbles. The... <laughs> The act in terms seemed to make it an offence for any except an incorporated company to raise transferable shares of stock, and at first it was so construed, the decisions seemingly going to the extent of holding that regardless of the act it was illegal at common law for any unincorporated society to raise transferable shares. Finally, however, more than a half a century after the act was passed, and indeed after it had been expressly repealed, it was definitely decided by the English courts, number one, 
that the act was directed at the raising of transferable shares only in those unincorporated companies whose purposes were mischievous and tended to the common grievance, and two, that it was not an offence, a common law, for an unincorporated company to have and issue transferable shares. Therefore, as said by Judge Lindley, the legality at common law of such companies may therefore be considered as finally established. It further seems this ground of illegality was urged chiefly because of the rule of pleading established by the courts requiring that all partners, however numerous, must be made parties defendant. The shareholders of these unincorporated companies being partners in contemplation of law and the judges finding it necessary to adhere to this rule of pleading considered such companies mischievous and illegal as it was both difficult and costly to obtain a corporate charter and a bubble act stopped the development of the joint stock society, enterprise languished, and for upwards of a century, industry was deprived of a certain amount of capital which would otherwise have been available. Therefore, it may be taken as firmly established that the privilege of raising and issuing transferable shares is a common law right and not a privilege peculiar to the corporation. The fact that the exercise of this right by the quasi-partnership or joint stock company is in derogation of the principal delectus personae and makes it difficult for the purposes of suit to identify the partners, Le lends an emphasis to the objection of its exercise by such companies which does not obtain with the trust. In the case of the pure trust, because of the absence of personal liability of the system to K trust, the public, this, sorry, in the case of the pure trust, because of the absence of personal liability of the K trust, the public is indifferent to the changing personnel of the beneficiaries. This is a matter of important consideration within the business trust in view of the requirement of equity that the beneficiaries of a trust be identified since in the business trust with changing beneficiaries the shares or certificates of beneficial interest furnish the indica indicia of identification their legality is of course essential in this connection it should be noted that as yet there has been no satisfactory determination of the exact nature of the sestes interests in a business trust that is whether they are mere choosers in action or equitable interests estates or titles in the corpus upon principle it would seem that they should be regarded not as jury in rem but jury in personam mere choosers in action Nevertheless, since equitable interests are commonly regarded not as mere choosers in action, but as interests in a corpus, when so regarded, their character will be determined by the character of the corpus being considered as personnel, yet as personnel, as personality, not as personality, as personality, or realty, personality. I'm going to have to Google that after this. Just making a note. That's an interesting one. Uh, wait a minute, sir. Beginning of, nevertheless, since equitable interests are commonly regarded not as mere choosers in action, but as interests in the corpus, when so regarded, their character will be determined by the character of the corpus, being considered as personality or realty, as the corpus is personality or realty. A recent decision contains a dictum that whether property of the trust is real property, the provision for assignability of shares without complying with the formalities necessary, necessary for a conveyance of real estate does not make them personal property. They represent equitable interests in the corpus, and if the corpus is real estate, it would seem that the transferability would depend upon the law. Governing the transfer of interests in real estate in the place where the real estate was situated in the absence of legislative authority, making special provision for their transfer. If the capital or corpus of the trust consists solely of realty and the trustees are directed to convert it into cash at the termination of the trust, then no equitable conversion will be deemed to have occurred and the property remains real property.
If the corpus consists of both personal and real property, and the trustees are dedicated, directed to convert at the termination of their trust, then under some cases, an equitable conversion will be deemed to have taken place at the inception of the trust, and the entire fund will be considered personality from that time forward. To avoid any possible any possibility that the shareholders shall be embarrassed in their right to transfer their interests, whatever the nature of those interests may be, by mere assignment of their certificates. It is advisable that the Declaration of Trust contain a peremptory direction to the trustees to convert the property, but allowing such conversion to be postponed in their discretion. The corpus, though consisting of real property alone, will then unquestionably be considered as having been converted from the beginning and the interests of the beneficiaries would be regarded if not mere choosers in action then as interests in personal property and hence personality this consideration is also of importance in connection with questions of inheritance and other taxes that may arise we conclude therefore that the business trust does not usurp the privileges of the corporation B, for usurping, for usurping the franchise of a corporation. Neither can it be said to usurp the franchise of a corporation, as well said by Missouri Springfield Court of Appeals. The corporate franchise is the right to exist as an entity for the purpose of doing things which are permitted under the law authorizing the incorporation. The things which the corporation is authorized to do are its powers as distinguished from its franchise that is its right to exist as a corporation. As the franchise, the distinguishing feature of the corporation is the artificial personality distinct from the individuals composing it. There can be no usurpation of corporate function unless there be an assumption of such distinguishing personality. To quote Judge Lindley again, what distinguishes corporations from other bodies is their independent personality, and no society which does not arrogate itself this character can be fairly said to assume to act as a corporation. C. Constitutional objection. Another objection which reasonably may be expected to be raised is this. Our Missouri State Constitution, Section 2, Art 12, provides... The term corporation, as used in this article, shall be construed to include all joint stock companies or associations having any powers or privileges not possessed by individuals or partnerships. Pardon me. The same definition appears as the first section of our laws relating generally to corporations. A great number of states have the same or substantially the same constitutional provision. It may be urged, therefore, that the business trust is a corporation within the meaning of this constitutional definition, and that not having been incorporated in the manner prescribed by law, it should not be recognized as a lawful institution and may be dissolved by quo warranto. This objection, though not free from difficulty, should not prevail. If the arrangement proposed is a pure trust and avoids associative powers among the beneficiaries, it certainly cannot be considered to be a joint stock company or an association. Whether the word association is to be qualified by joint stock or not. Otherwise, it might be unsafe to constitute any trust with more than one trustee and one beneficiary particularly if intended that the trustees should conduct or transact any business. Again, does not the constitutional provision mean joint stock companies and associations that have the exercise under grant of the sovereign powers and privileges not possessed by individuals or partnerships? Furthermore, property to interpret this section Furthermore, properly to, to interpret this section requires that it be read in conjunction with section 2 of the same article, providing that no corporation after the adoption of this constitution shall be created by special laws. When it is remembered that these sections first appeared in the Constitution of 1865 and that their purpose was to put an end to the practice of granting corporate charters by special acts of the legislature, it seems manifest that the intention was to define corporation and provide that no such thing thereafter could be created by special laws. 
Hence, even if the business trust was considered as a joint stock company or association with powers and privileges not possessed by individuals and partnerships, it could reasonably be urged that the only effect of the constitutional provisions referred to is to pre preclude their establishment by special laws. Again, so far from rendering invalid such stock companies and associations, our courts have construed their this constitutional and statutory definition to be in rec to be recognition of them, entitling them to sue and be sued as entities in the courts of our state, and recent statutory amendment so regards them. These views find support in a very carefully considered and exhaustive opinion by the Supreme Court of Idaho, though perhaps they are at variance, in part at least with the recent decision of the Supreme Court of Kansas. Section 13. Does it afford limited liability? Assuming, therefore, the legality of the business trust, the all-important question arises whether it possesses that attribute which is indispensable if it is to serve as a substitute for business corporation, namely limited liability of the investors or shareholders. First, as to the Sestike Trust or shareholders, the law is firmly settled that the Sestike Trust is not personally liable for the obligations incurred by the trustee in the management of the trust estate. For this reason, this for the reason that the trustee has no authority to bind ex directo the Sestike Trust. The trustee is not an agent, but upon the contrary, he himself is the principal. He is the owner. In trust, it is true of the property and the business he transacts is his business, even though another is to receive the benefits or profits therefrom. A trustee is a man who is the owner of the property and deals with it as principal, as owner and as master, subject only to an equitable obligation to account to persons to whom he stands in the relation of trustee and who are the sister key trust. Since in relation to the property and the business in which it is employed, he stands as proprietor, as principal, as master, upon no recognized principle of law can the beneficiary be held for his obligation with respect to that property and that business. Therefore, in the few cases that have arisen in which creditors of trustees in business trusts have undertaken to hold the shareholders liable, they have failed. If the declaration of trust confers absolute uncontrolled power upon the trustees with respect to the management of the property given them, then the beneficiaries have only the rights that are implied because they are fundamental to the trust relation, viz. to call upon the trustees to account, to have them removed for misconduct or neglect, to receive the income while the trust lasts, and their share of the corpus or of the conversion thereof upon its termination, then plainly the arrangement is a pure trust and the shareholders are not liable to creditors. It transpires, however, that sometimes a declaration of trust has been so drawn that it is uncertain whether it constitutes in truth and tr a trust. This arises from the fact that the provisions thereof have given certain rights to the beneficiaries in addition to and beyond those fundamentally and necessarily adherent to the Sister K Trust. For example, the right to hold meetings and fill vacancies among the trustees, to elect the trustees periodically, to remove trustees and choose successors, to initiate and adopt and to consent and to amendments to the trust agreement, to direct or agree to the termination of the trust and to give direction to the trustees. Sounds a lot like a government or a country to me, just very quickly. In any of such cases, it is submitted that the inquiry should be who are the owners of the property and of the business in which it is employed. Is it, if the trustees they are the principals and masters and are arrangement and the arrangement is a strict trust. If the shareholders, they are principals, they are the principals, the masters, and the trustees, so called are mere agents, and a strict trust does not exist. Let me read that again. 
It is submitted that the inquiry should be who are the owners of the property and of the business in which it is employed. If the trustees, they are the principals, masters, and the arrangement is a strict trust. If the shareholders, they are the principals and masters as above, and the trustees, so-called mere agents instead of trustees, and a strict trust then does not exist. If the shareholders are the principals and the trustees are agents, then it would follow the necessity that the shareholders would be personally liable for the conduct of their agents. Oops. Okay, then submitted that the uh, completely lost my place there. I pressed a down arrow instead of forward arrow, and I thought I jumped like 10 pages or something, but. I'll just continue from, in any of such cases, it is submitted that the inquiry should be who are the owners of the property. If the shareholders are the principals and the trustees are agents, then it would follow them of necessity that their shareholders would be personally liable for the conduct of their agents and that to whether they, the shareholders, constitute a partnership or not. At least this would be true in the absence of contract or estoppel. Now, to determine whether the trustees are the owners of the property and of the business in which it is employed, the intention of the parties as expressed in the trust instrument should control. That is, the legal intention, the intention which the law will impute to them from what they have written. If the instrument is in trust form and expressly or impliedly indicates that it is not the intention that the trustees shall have authority to bind the shareholders personally and reserves to the shareholders only those rights which are consonant with the relation of trustee and sister care trust, then a trust has been established. Even though those rights may also be such as pertain to other relations, for example, a principal may discharge his agent and employ another, and so may a partnership and joint stock company but so may the settler of a trust empower the Sestake trust to remove the trustee and appoint a successor. The principal may impose upon his agent new powers and duties, and so may a partnership and joint stock company. But the creator of a trust may likewise give the beneficiaries the right to annul uses and appoint new uses in the place thereof. The principal, the partnership and the joint stock company having an agent to sell property may make his right to sell dependent upon the employer's, pardon me, upon the employer's acquiescence first obtained. And so may the settler of a trust provide that the trustee before disposing of the property shall first obtain the consent of the Sestike trust. Why may not association, which is essential to the partnership be also enjoyed by sister care trust and indeed be provided for by the trust instru instrument. The possession of the sister care trust of these rights, in addition to those already mentioned as being rights which they impliedly have by virtue of the trust relation, should by no means of itself deprive the trustees pardon me, of their ownership of the property and of the business in which it is directed to be employed. The beneficiaries may have these additional rights and the trustees still be the owners of the property and of the business if that is what is was intended by the parties. In Williams v. Milton, 215 Mass 1, Judge Loring undertook to establish a test by which to determine a strict trust has been created. He says that this depends on A, the, the association provided for among the sisters, B, the nature and extent of rights reserved to them, that if they are to associate through meetings and have rights sufficient in extent to make them masters over the trustees, then the arrangement is not a trust, but is a partnership. But the trouble with this test is that if it does not enable, is that it does not enable us to know just what association and how much power make sestes partners. 
In this very case, the shareholders had the right, A, to consent to an alteration or amendment of the trust instrument, and B, to a termination of the trust before the time fixed in the deed. It was held that these were not rights sufficient in extent to convert the trustees into agents and thereby the arrangement into a partnership, but that the trustees still remained the masters of the trust property. On the other hand, the same opinion indicates that should a trust instrument reserve to the beneficial owners the right to elect the trustees and their officers annually, or the right to hold meetings, remove trustees, give instructions to trustees, alter or amend the declaration of trust, and direct the trustees to terminate the trust, the so-called trustees would be considered as mere agents, the certificate owners Pardon me, the certificate owners, principles, and the arrangement a partnership, but says this same opinion, the mere right of the shareholders to have meetings and to amend the declaration of trust by conferring additional powers upon the trustees will not make them partners. The inconclusiveness and unsatisfactory character of the Williams v. Milton test is further emphasized in the case in Rhode Island in Kansas since decided. In the former, the common shareholders had the right to remove a trustee and appoint a new one in his stead, and the meetings of the shareholders were provided for at which they might amend the declaration of the trust with the consent of the trustees and terminate the trust at any time. And yet the arrangement was held to be a strict trust in these rights in the system in, in, insufficient to cons, cons, sorry and yet the arrangement was held to be a strict trust and these rights of the sisters insufficient to constitute a partnership. In the Kansas case referred to, the trust instrument made provision for the for meetings of the shareholders and the election by them of the trustees annually. This was held not to be control of And this was held not to be control of sufficient extent to deprive an arrangement of the character of a true trust under the aforesaid test laid down in Williams v. Milton as applied in later Massachusetts cases. The trust instruments under consideration in both Rhode Island and Kansas cases might reasonably be held to constitute partnerships. Again, if power to control the trustees is alone to be absolutely decisive, then what shall we say when the sisters have the right to be trustees and pursuant to such rights, sisters owning a majority or perhaps 90 or 95% of the beneficial shares constitute the board of trustees? Williams v. Milton is fairly subject to criticism because one, it assumes that there can be no middle ground between the trust and the partnership, and that if there were is no trust, there must be a partnership. This we are unwilling to concede. Number two, it assumes that if there is a partnership, there can be no trust. On principle, this should not be so, particularly if the corpus is personal property. Why may not a partnership itself be the Sestake Trust? Two of the three judges in Smith v. Anderson clearly held that an association might be the beneficiary of an express trust. That's fascination. Fascinating. Three, and above all, it makes the question more complex by giving insufficient consideration to the intention of the parties and by approaching it from the field of partnership and examining it in the light of law of partnership, seeing if perchance characteristics of that relation may not be found, whereas it should be approached from the field of the expressed trust, remembering that the expressed intention of the parties must control, uh, of the parties must control, and having in mind the principles and rules of equity concerning the trust relation. Therefore, we urge that though under the trust instrument, the sisters have rights in addition to these, those necessarily adhering to the trust relation, even though such additional rights may pertain to other relations, such as principal and agent, partnership and joint stock company, nevertheless, if they are also rights under which under established principles of equity assisting may enjoy and the instrument discloses otherwise that a trust was intended, then effect should be given to the intention of the parties and the trustees 
be held to be the owners of the property and of the business. The principles, the masters, it is the intention of the party that creates and governs uses and trusts. That should be obvious. Otherwise, we could just run around and label you know, government a terrorist organization and then take them down straight away. I mean, in ways we can, but not so simply. And that's where we derive our protections from is uh, a delay in immediate action sometimes to ensure that action is coordinated appropriately and not hastily or emotionally reactive. I'll try the best I can not to add too much in. Until more general general consideration, sorry. Yes, until more general consideration shall have been given to this question by the courts and it can be said that there is a preponderance of authority, the only absolutely safe course to pursue in drafting the trust instrument is to see to it that the shareholders are not given their an associate relation or any rights beyond those which the law implies and affixes to Sestike Trust. It must not be concluded, however, that if the declaration does not create a strict trust, it of necessity follows that the shareholders are liable as partners or otherwise for the conduct of the so-called trustees. Even in such circumstances, if the declaration provides against liability upon the part of the Sestike Trust, subjects the trust estate to the discharge of all obligations requires creditors to look solely to the funds of the estate for payment and the trustees to so contract. The creditor may, by contract, be required to look solely to the trust property for reimbursement. Second, as to the trustees, who may be and who may be and their liability. Here again, the established principles of equity control, speaking generally, any whom the settlers or creators of a trust desire may be selected to be the trustees. Sestic trust are not disqualified from being also trustees. For while the rule is that if the equitable and the legal estates meet in one and the same person, the equitable estates estate merges into the legal estate, thereby extinguishing the trust or confidence, yet both estates must be con con commensurate with each other. Others can, others there can be no merger. Otherwise, there can be no merger. Sorry. Therefore, there should be no legal objection to the trustees being Sestike Trust, certainly not if they are not all of the Sestike Trust. Indeed, it has been emphasized that in such case, it would be presumed that in promoting the interests of the Sestike Trust, the trustees, to so great an extent, promote their own interests. But manifestly, one may not be a trustee if he himself is in fact a settler and sole beneficiary. The trustee is not an agent either of the Sestike Trust or of the estate. He is the owner of the trust property and of the trust business. He is the principal, the master. Therefore, his acts are his own acts and... His contracts are his own contracts, and for both he is personally responsible. More than half a century ago, a very eminent authority on the law of trustees wrote, In the present state of law, no trustee could be advised under any circumstance to undertake, undertake the responsibility of carrying on any trade for others. For by doing so, he adopts the same risks and liabilities as persons who trade on their own account, while he can participate in none of the profits. And as a matter of ordinary prudence, a trust for such a purpose should be unhesitatingly declined. I can't help but reference that particular quote with what we now call regular employment. To this consideration, a very thoughtful writer attributes the fact that corporate organization has been preferred to trusts for carrying on trade. Whether deterrent effect this ominous statement of the law may have had, whatever deterrent effect this ominous statement of the law may have had in the past, the apprehensions excited by it have in recent years been greatly allayed by the protection which insurance affords and by the growing practice among trustees of contracting against personal liability. 
the right of the trustee to so contract and thereby to require the creditor to look solely to the trust estate for compensation is now fully recognized as said by Mr. Justice Woods in Taylor v. Davis. If a trustee contracting for the benefit of a trust wants to protect himself from individual liability on the contract, he must stipulate that he is not to be personally responsible, but that the other party is to look solely to the trust estate. The trust instrument, therefore, should provide against personal liability upon the part of the trustees and that those with whom they deal must look to the property of the trust for compensation. And in their contracts, the trustees should, by explicit reference to that provision of the trust, give notice of their exemption from personal liability, and that the other contracting party must look solely to the property of the trust for payment of any obligation. In any event, of course, the trustees have the right to indemnify themselves out of the property of the trust estate. Advantages, section 14, over corporations. Let us consider the business trust in connection with the corporate disadvantages we have already mentioned. Prejudice. There is a popular significance attached to the word trust, making it synonymous with monopoly or conspiracy and restraint of trade. This does not presage a reception of the business trust by the public with a mind free from prejudice until this odious impression can be removed and the people come to understand the true significance of the express trust and its use as a legitimate vehicle of trade, it is unlikely that it will find the public attitude toward it more benign than it does the corporation. I had grown up never with those assumptions about what a trust is, but then this is back in 1920. That's fascinating. I was under the assumption growing up that trusts were a good thing, whereas 100 years ago, uh, they were kind of implied to be the opposite in the public eye. It's very interesting. And also grounds for what we refer to as conspiracy theory. Be, uh, as in being a legitimate thing and not just something made up in somebody's mind, because clearly if a trust exists, then the trust itself is conspiring against everybody who isn't inside the trust, right? I mean, not directly in some ways, you could say, depending, like a public trust is has all of its intentions and everything in the public domain, so it's freely available. But a private trust is, by definition, a conspiratorial organization, as its private nature is as such. And so, too, on that note, is national secrets and um, you know, national security and that type of thing. You know, clearly, information needs to be kept aside and used and schemed around other people for the protection and safety of others. That's what we usually say. How do we know until we find out? B, migratory rights considered. The business trust has a decided advantage over the corporation for the trustees of persons and also citizens within the meaning of Section 2, Article 4 of the Constitution of the United States, and they are therefore entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, and they may of right go into every state and their transact business without molestation upon equal terms with every other citizen. C. Inquisitorial legislation. Again, for this purpose at least, the business trust is free from the necessity of making periodical reports and from inquisitorial legislation of every kind. There is, of course, no assurance for how long this condition will continue. continue. But how far the state may constitutionally go in attempts to regulate businesses, business transacted in this form pursuant to the exercise of the common law right to contract, and whether the business trust may constitutionally be singled out from all other trusts to be the object of legislative attack, are questions that will be ever present to operate as deterrence against hasty or radical action. Then to the question whether exceptions may be imposed upon this form of commercial activity arranged under the right of contract, which are not imposed upon partnerships, will also give the legis legislature pause. It is 
Interesting to note that in Massachusetts, except in the case of trusts holding securities of public service corporations, the legislature has never undertaken to require more than a public filing of the declaration of trust. Taxation, section D, or part D of this section. In matters of taxation, the advantage is decidedly with the business trust. The corporation must pay an organization tax, property tax, franchise tax, state federal capital stock tax, and state federal income tax. It would establish agencies in other states. It must do so upon the terms prescribed by those states, paying always an incorporation tax to be followed in turn with the obligation of their also making the various reports and paying the various assessments imposed upon corporations. Then there is a stock transfer tax, and often the separate tax against the shareholder upon his share even though he lives in the state of the corporation's nativity, with the express trust, on the contrary. It is believed that no one case, that no case can be found upholding the right to tax the corpus of the trust estate and also the equitable interest therein. Manifestly, this would be doable. Sorry, manifestly, this would be double taxation and would impose a burden upon those needing the protection of the trust which others more fortunate in not needing that protection would escape. Since the business trust is a creation of the parties, common law right of contract of franchise tax could not be imposed upon it. And the Supreme Court of Massachusetts decided that the shares in a trust held to be a partnership could not be taxed to the owner. Also, that as an excise that an excise tax on the corporation could not constitutionally be applied to such associations. It should be noted, however, that a majority of the judges of that court, in an opinion to the legislature, held that a stock transfer tax, including tax on shares in unincorporated associations, would be constitutional. <clears throat> the Federal Corporation Tax Law of 1909 provided for the payment of special excise tax by every corporation, joint stock company, or association organized for profit and having the capital stock represented by shares. The United States Supreme Court held that a trust formed for the purpose of purchasing, holding, and selling lands and buildings in Boston was not required to pay any taxes under this law. This upon the ground that the tax was an excise tax upon the privilege of doing business in a corporate capacity and with the advantages which arise from corporate or quasi-corporate organization. It was therefore said that the act should be held not to apply to such a trust, but to embrace only such corporations as and joint stock associations as are organized under some statute or derive from that last, from that source some quality or benefit not existing at the common law. Perhaps to the case of Crocker v. Malley, more than to any other one thing should be attributed the widespread and growing interest of the business trust. Court held had under consideration a trust instrument known as the West Massachusetts Realty Trust drawn by Mr. Felix Rackinen of the Boston Bar. This instrument, with clearness and brevity, combines adequate comprehensiveness and may well serve as a model. See appendix. It enjoys the distinguish, distinction of being the first and thus far the only instrument of the class we are considering to be held by the highest court of the land to constitute a pure trust. Though consent to the beneficial owners was required to fill a vacancy among the trustees and for a modification of the terms of the trust, the court held that the agreement did not constitute either a joint stock company association or partnership within the meaning of the Income Tax Act of 1913, but that it was a pure trust and should be assessed under the provisions of that act relating to fiduciaries. In view of the decision that the, in that case, it is believed that under the present income tax law, such a trust would not be considered a corporation or a person, as those terms are defined in the Act, but that, the, but that the tax would have to be levied under the sections relating to estates, trusts, and fiduciaries. Section 15, Disadvantages. Candua requires the admission, however, that the business trust is not entirely 
without its disadvantages. As a practical matter, the greatest of these, no doubt, is the very fact that it is comparatively new. That is, it has not been in general use and it, that its status, therefore, is as yet not well defined. That it will, in a course of time, incite legislation of some character. It is reasonable to expect that, sorry, and what that it will, in the course of time, incite legislation of some character. It is reasonable to expect, and what the nature of this legislation will be, or to what extent it may constitutionally go, none can foretell. The tradition and respectable authority are opposed to allowing large numbers of men an unlimited and unregulated power of grouping themselves for a common purpose, and yet experience thus far would not warrant the prophecy that the legislation will be a hostile character. We have already observed that Massachusetts has done no more than require the public filing of a trust declaration, except in the cases of trusts holding securities of public service organization, corporations. The state of Oklahoma has, by recent legislation, legislative enactment, completely recognized and validated the business trust and exempted the trustees and beneficiaries from personal liability and required creditors to look solely to the trust estate for reimbursement. Again, there is comfort in the reflection that as yet there is practically no other legislation at all. Then too, there are important inquiries which will remain without satisfactory answers until there shall be further adju adjudication. Such, for example, as the precise nature of the sestes' interest, to what extent the sestes may be also trustees, whether the shareholders may periodically choose trustees, and especially a satisfactory guide by which to determine precisely the line of division between the strict trust and the partnership or other relation. Again, will the trust violate the rule against perpetuities and restraints upon alienation in the absence of preemptory requirement that it be terminated with the period of lives in being and 21 years and nine months thereafter? There is great contrariety of opinion upon this last question. The better rule would seem to be that where there are persons in being at the creation of an estate capable of conveying an immediate and absolute estate in fee, in possession, there is no suspension of the power of alienation and no question as to the perpetuities can arise. But since it cannot be said that this is the established rule, prudence dictates that the trust agreement provide for its termination within the period prescribed by the rule against perpetuities. In this respect, the corporation would seem to have the advantage, but it is an advantage more seeming than actual, for in most states, the trust could be made to continue for a period of 21 years beyond the death of the last survivor of the youngest of living children, a period, we dare say, entirely adequate to its needs and greatly in excess of the customary two score years and 10 of the business corporation. Pretty sure, as a side note, <clears throat> uh, that's what revesting is um, coming about for. Section 16, conclusions. The following conclusions are believed to be warranted. Number one, for reasons that are manifest, the express trust cannot be used as a substitute for public service corporations or for corporations carrying on business of a public or quasi-public character at all times requiring the subject to state regulation and control, such as banking and insurance. Number two, the business trust cannot be used as a substitute for those corporations with three stockholders, two of whom are dummies. Number three, the express trust has been used as an agency of business and trade chiefly in Massachusetts and has been so used there not as a substitute for the corporation, but because the corporation could not until recently be used in the field in which the trust has been principally employed, namely in the business of dealing in real property. 103 of such trusts said to own 
in the city of Boston alone, real property of the value of $250 million, were investigated in 1912 pursuant to legislative direction by the tax commissioner of that commonwealth. He reported as advantages claimed by these trusts. These associations have been found by the experience of 25 years to be a convenient, safe, and unobjectionable character of cooperative ownership and management. They are for the interest alike of the investor and the public. B, the form of organization ensures a continuity of management and control, which appeals strongly to investors in real estate, which cannot be secured by a corporation with changing offices. The trustees who are the managing officers of a trust are not so likely to be changed as are the directors of a corporation. C. It affords a more economical and more convenient and flexible form of management than does a corporation. Trustees can transact business with more ease and rapidity than directors. Nevertheless, it is probable that at that time, not more than a dozen of these trusts were engaged in industrial enterprises. Thus, it would seem that in the state where the business trust is best known, the possibilities as a business agency superior to the corporation were either doubted or not appreciated. Number four, the declaration or agreement of trust need not make the beneficiaries the principals, neither need it constitute the trustees or the beneficiaries or both together a partnership, joint stock company or association. But when properly drafted, it is a pure trust, which affords an agency in all respects legal and one in principle entirely adequate to be used to carry on any business for the benefit of two or more investors that is now conducted by the ordinary manufacturing of pri or private business corporation. Whether in practice it will constitute such agency remains to be demonstrated by fuller experience and its more general utilization. Number five, its employment would seem to be ideal. A, as a substitute for holding and for investment companies, uh, that is companies merely holding the stock of corporations and companies engaged in the business of dealing in, buying and selling as investments, stocks, bonds, and commercial paper. B, as a substitute for companies whose business travels a beaten path and is routine in character, such as owning and conducting an office or apartment building, or hotel, or developing a subdivision, or doing a specified building or construction work under a contract, or operating a mine, and in this class might appropriately be placed also companies handling large estates. Number six, the inconvenience attended upon the necessity of express notice and contract in order to absolve the trustees from liability is a practical consideration tending to repress its use in new ventures and to confine it to conversions from the corporate form of seasoned established and proven enterprises who whose methods are fixed and whose risks with reasonable certainty can be assessed its chief advantages over the corporation are found a in the convenience continuity and flexibility of the management b in its migratory rights c in its freedom from visitorial inquisitorial laws and the consequent immunity of the necessity of making periodical reports which disclose its condition and affairs and d in matters of taxation this is very curious because we've got number four five six eight and on we go <laughs> no number seven on the other hand Disadvantages of a very practical nature are recognized in that a the this employment of the express trust upon me this employment of the express trust is new b attacks upon its validity with new weapons are yet to be encountered c regulatory and perhaps repressive legislation affecting it may reasonably be expected d the precise nature of seste's interest remains still undetermined E, an adequate chart disclosing clearly the line demarcation between the domain of the trust and that of a partnership or of relation is yet to be drawn. F, what rights the beneficiaries may have in addition to those essential to every Sestigate trust and whether they may periodically choose trustees or remove 
trustees fill vacancies or even themselves be trustees if the trustees will then be also owners of the majority of beneficial interests are questions still to be determined. Thus, riper practical experience is essential and much law has yet to be made in many decisions yet to be read and rendered before the status of the business trust can, with entire satisfaction, be known and defined. Yay! And then we move on to the um, appendix, which goes yeah from about yeah, halfway, fifty-two ish, all the way down to one hundred and five. We start off with a couple of interesting examples, which is one of the ones that he pointed out in the text there. The what what you said, realty trust. Um, there's also a couple more there that have been listed for. Um, research purposes and then at the very end there is a, a trust template that you can use for um, figuring it out and that would be And that would be having a problem with the floating, as it turns out. <laughs> and with that, we'll call it. If you would like a copy of the appendix, then it's available within the PDF in the link of the comment, uh, not in the comments, in the description. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned. Don't forget to do all the things and follow me and, you know, be awesome, you know. <laughs> it's basically all that it is. Get out there and enjoy yourself and have fun. Love to you all.